Understanding and techniques for having a calm soul uh, as we stand up to domination and violence. And let me remind everyone and uh, introduce this concept to others that uh, that the, the domination and the violence, the domination which is the source of the violence, is what I have called Christian Western supremacy. And. What I did last night is I used, uh, for an example, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So let me take a moment now, and uh, I know there are a few people who are familiar with Bonhoeffer. You tell us who Bonhoeffer was or what he was about. Somebody, anybody. He uh, was like a German Nazi leader who Okay, did you hear that in the back? Okay. Sorry. Thank you. He also Pardon? came to America, and oh, I found this out last night, <laughs> and um, was a part of a church in Harlem, and uh, during a time when that was, uh, sorry, a um, black church in Harlem, and um, at a time when that would not be okay, whites were not going to black churches, and black people were not going to white people <laughs> churches <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and the reverend was it or the yeah, yeah. pastor was mm -hmm. um, kind of exposing his church to Dietrich Bonhoeffer's teaching and and it was also Im impacting his uh, Dietrich's life as well um, to be allowed to speak in okay. their church these are good I like it Anybody else? Um, the uh, Westminster Abbey has a, a new facade, and it has 20th century martyrs from around the world 
instead of the twelve apostles. Yeah. And uh, so and uh, Bonhoeffer is one of those. Oh, I didn't know that. Cool. What church? Westminster Abbey. In, in, Peru, in Peru, right? In case you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any remarks uh, uh, on Bonhoeffer? I just I want to take this moment to try to get get something of a grasp of, of who he was. He wasn't just um, against the Nazis, but he was uh, part of a plan to assassinate Hitler as well. Okay. He really emphasized ethics based on a living relationship with God. From what I understand last night, he was a kind of a typical Orion uh, person who was standing up for um, ethnic and religious minorities in the face of Nazi Germany. So it's, um, I think it's doubly threatening to Nazi Germany to have somebody from within yeah. stand up against the I like that. I feel that. <laughs> I, I think that the very fact that he was from a kind of an aristocratic background mm -hmm. is why he was able to exist for so long, in spite of the fact that he was on the radio in 1933 when Hitler came to power, and he declared that the powers of Antichrist had just taken over Germany. And the radio talk was stopped after eight minutes. And from that time, he was a suspected person. So, you know, he, there's a, I think the, he, when he came back to Germany after being in Britain and then America, he was thinking instead of going to work with Mahatma Gandhi in India because he was a convicted, he was a pacifist. But he decided to go back to Germany because he said, I, if I don't go through the church's tribulation and suffering with her, how can I have any part in rebuilding her? Very good. <clears throat> cool. And he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Yes. And, yeah, I guess you could say he paid the price. <coughs> yes. Okay. When he went to Harlem, he was basically showing that not all white people, all Aryans, or whatever, were as bad as the people that were oppressing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is pretty rich. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to to kind of capture the spirit of Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, because he models for uh, white Christians of his era and beyond, uh, what it means to stand up to domination violence in the form of Christian Western supremacy. Um, and in fact, I'm going to read another excerpt from uh, Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus by Reggie L. Williams. Uh, except by, there it is, all right. Bonhoeffer remains the only prominent white theologian of the 20th century to speak about racism as a Christian problem. As a white man, Bonhoeffer had access to multiple audiences in opposition to racial dim discrimination that were not available to people of color. And he appropriated what he learned in Harlem for that purpose. The black Jesus became a discursive figure representing God with and for the despised and rejected of all humanity. In America, Bonhoeffer found that the despised and rejected were black people. The demand for recognition by African Americans in the Harlem Renaissance was a demand for justice that can only come with the acknowledgement of their co-humanity. And Bonhoeffer's emphasis on being with and for others as a theological concept included a social and psychological dynamic of humanizing others and interrupting their abuse. His final imprisonment and death was a direct result of his empathic insistence 
that the church come to the aid of social victims. In Harlem, Bonhoeffer saw black Christians connecting with Christ as an unconditional obligation, not in power and privilege, but in suffering humanity. In Harlem, Bonhoeffer began learning to embrace Christ hidden in suffering as resistance to oppression. His new awareness of racism gave him unique insight into nationalism as the racialized mixture of God and country embodied in idealized Aryan humanity. That reality included Christian identity synthesized into an untenable way of being in the world and of viewing self and others in it. Harlan provided what he needed to see the world differently and to imagine a different way of being a Christian within it. So, Bonhoeffer is a primary figure when it comes to uh, Christians' presence and, uh, and work uh, during World War II. And after World War II, I pointed out last night that there was this stroke of conscience, this moment of reflection uh, internationally, and the Holocaust began to help people uh, uh, think differently about themselves. And it, de it destabilized the sense of Christian Western supremacy. And we Christians learned a lot about ourselves in that period. But I want to say that there's a whole lot more to discover. That was not the point of arrival. That was, that was a breakthrough. One beautiful development from that period is how today's Vatican is so very different from the papacy of that era. When you see Pope Francis standing up for refugees, particularly Syrian refugees, but just refugees in general, that's very different from Pope Pius XII, who took a neutral position. And even though he was besieged with requests from not just Jews, but many Gentiles, to make a statement about what was going on to Jewish people, in Europe, he refused to say anything about it. But today's Vatican is so very different from that. They take the lead in the world when it comes to this kind of thing. When, when, when governments are hesitating, when governments are balking, uh, uh, there's, a, there's uh, an assertiveness about today's uh, papacy. So during that period, we Christians learned a lot about ourselves because the Holocaust put the horrors of Christian Western supremacy in our face. When I say our face, I'm talking collectively of Christianity because I hadn't been born yet. So, I, all right. So, just want to be clear. <laughs> um, uh, one uh, beautiful development, as I said, is that you know we, we see a different kind of papacy, but it's not just a, 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 the, the the Christians who are Catholic who are the beneficiaries of what. Uh, the Jews sacrifice, not the Jews only, okay, let's be clear that the Jews are the critical mass, but it's gays, it's Jehovah's Witnesses, um, who else? Gypsies. Gypsies. Gypsies, yes, absolutely. The disabled. And, mm -hmm. The disabled. The disabled, oh, absolutely. And uh, pretty much anybody who is an ethnic minority. Um, and so these, these folks paid the price and, and basically they were sacrificed essentially to an ideology that is traceable to uh, Christian Western supremacy. There were three outcomes from this moment of international reflection that, that I want to address. Two of them I covered last night, and the third one I want to get to tonight. The three outcomes from this stroke of conscience, and you can go to the next slide. Um, the first one is the formation of the state of Israel. Uh, we need to understand that the existence of Israel is a colonial project. And what I mean by that is that um, uh, the, the lands around Israel had been occupied, uh, had been uh, controlled by, uh, by other nation, European nations, particularly in this case, the UK. And so there had to be some concession. At first, the UK it was one of the last countries to concede uh, that Israel needed a homeland. But the Jews 
uh, many Jews. And now at the beginning of the 20th century, most Jews in the world did not want a homeland. I mean, they, they were surveyed, Russian Jews, American Jews, did not want a homeland. They wanted to adapt to the world where they were. They felt like they should receive the dignity, the worth, and that they were entitled to be where they were. But the Holocaust changed all of this because they found out how horribly unwelcome they could be. And so we find Jews wanting from all over the world to, to come to, you know, not necessarily at that time was it uh, uh, the Levant, the, uh, the Palestine. They were, they were cre seeking creative solutions as to where can we go? We need a homeland. They, they talked about a location in Africa, uh, a location in South America. Um, but ultimately they said, you know, the religious element went out and they said we, we need to go to Palestine. But we need to remember that, that Palestine was being dwelt in by, by Arab peoples, um, but at the same time it was dominated by Europeans, the, the whole Levant. When ultimately uh, the United Nations, when ultimately European powers, along with the United States, decided that we will support uh, the, the Israeli presence, the Jewish presence in Israel, um, what, what that meant was they had to overrule the, uh, the, the thinking, the emotions, the, the rights of the people who were living there. And so there's this conflict. This is extremely complex because, uh, and, you know, I've talked with, um, with different uh, Jews, diff people of different uh, uh, politics about this. I've talked to Zionists, and I've talked to Jews who are not Zionists, and it seems like they are all on the same page when I, when I bring this up. And I say that Israel is a colonial project, and Europe and the West have never dealt with its inherent anti-Semitism. And so uh, we can never find complete peace with this scenario until there is a reconciliation, until there is a recognition of the anti-Semitism in the West. But again, number one outcome was the formation of the state of Israel. Number two outcome of World War II and, and the, the Holocaust is it connected, uh, you know, I connected this to a more robust civil rights movement in the US because this, this period of, of, of light, of, uh, of conscience, um, impacted the United States so that uh, there was a, a, a more persistent regard for the humanity of Americans uh, who, first of all, who went to fight in World War II and came back to, uh, to abject poverty and mistreatment uh, in their own land. Uh, there, 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 there was a change in the atmosphere and it opened the door so that there were more people in the majority who wanted to become advocates particularly Jewish people, wanted to be strong advocates for African Americans. And, and thus you see in the beginning of the 50s, a change in the Supreme Court, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1953, um, where it uh, struck down the legality of segregated schools. Um, and, uh, and other things that began to emerge, you know, most famously is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, and Martin Luther King you know, the story of Rosa Parks sitting on the bus and refusing to give up her seat. These things, these things are reverberations of the Holocaust. Now, the, the third thing that I want to talk about is a secondary and generally delayed effect, and it is the migration of colonized peoples to the centers of empire. What I mean by this is that after the the colonial uh, presence began to recede around the world. I mean, when the UK left India and Ghana, when France left, uh, when France left uh, uh, the, the west coast of Africa and Belgium left the central parts of Africa and France left Rwanda and Burundi and uh, all of these countries were leaving where they were ruling to focus on their own homelands because of this brief moment of reflection. Well. You look two generations later to this moment in history, and we find that the people from those lands are, are migrating or immigrating or becoming refugees to those countries. They're trying, the pe you know, people from, from, from Africa and for India for, for some time, they're finding, they're finding a, a, a home in Germany, 
of all places. They're, they're, they're finding a home in the UK, they're finding a home in Spain and in France. Um, and uh, the, the observation that that leads to is uh, in the US, the colonized people were, were on the same homeland as the colonizers. So it's a different kind of scenario. We don't see uh, a migration of colonized people to the centers of empire that include the US because uh, the, the, the indigenous people were there. So this is the difference between uh, the colonialism of, uh, of Europe and Asia and Africa and, uh, and many island nations. Uh, the difference is, is that Europeans were able to leave uh, they were able to leave Asia. They were, you know, they were able to leave Hong Kong at, you know, at a later date. But Americans colonized people on their own land, so there's nowhere to go. So we have this very uh, awkward relationship. Not only do we have uh, uh, Americans living on the same land, and of course this extrapolates to Canada, um, but but America also lives. Uh, on the same land with the descendants of the people they enslaved uh, centuries before, which creates a complicated circumstance. And um, uh, if America could handle it better, and if Canada could be a model maybe in some ways, but Canada could handle it better, um, then perhaps we could say something to these other countries that are just now beginning to experience the return, not the return, but the migration of these people. Why are they migrating? Because when, when Europe, when the West receded from all these other places, they left instability. They left corrupt governments in many cases. They left uh, uh, lands without infrastructures. They left, some, in some cases, puppet rulers. Uh, and uh, and they had carved up, particularly Africa, and you know you look at places like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar. They had carved it up in ways that people couldn't necessarily relate to one another nationalistically or religiously. Peter, a great example of that is England and France arguing over areas of Israel and Palestine, and not understanding about historic water rights mm -hmm. in a land where water is the most important thing yeah. and cutting people off from centuries of water usage uh, drawing the boundary line in a way that cuts them off. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else have an observation on that? Well, in, in the States we live constantly with the tension of uh, colonized people, um, indigenous people, and what to do about them. Because, because the, 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 the peoples that did the colonizing can't just up and leave. The term is called settler co colonialism. Anybody heard that term? You have? Okay. What can you say about settler colonialism? Can you define it or just explain something about it? No. Okay. <laughs> I'd rather you did. <laughs> All right. Settler colonialism. Hey. Yeah. Just one. I think they can get up and leave. <laughs> I, I, I would say gated communities. Oh, well, yeah. Well, we're get, yes. <laughs> That's not leaving. <laughs> it is. No. It's still in America. Peter yeah. Forsen. Yeah. <laughs> well, but listen. But listen. <laughs> They also put the people that they have colonized and gated communities, yeah, if you catch my drift. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, settler colonialism, the, the difference between settler colonialism and colonialism is uh, you settle on a land and the primary commodity is land itself. Whereas other colonialism is about gold or human beings, uh, things like that. Whatever the resources are, uh, spices, oil, diamonds. Uh, but when, when, when land is the commodity, then it's hard to let it go. You can't, you can't, you know, can't go to like, like 
you can colonize South Africa and say, okay, we'll, get, we'll let go of the diamond mines, okay? But we can't do that when you actually live on the land. So I want to take a moment here to talk about indigenous peoples in America. And the way that I'm going to talk about it is I, I'm going to, to read from the next slide uh, an indigenous people's history of the United States. And I know your, your class is reading uh, Howard Zinn's book, um, what's the title? The uh, People's History of the U.S. Okay. Well, this book is only a year old, but in my opinion, it, it is as uh, authoritative and necessary as Howard Zinn's book. And it is the first comprehensive history written by someone who is um, of uh, indigenous ancestry in the U.S., and it is extremely scholarly, uh, tremendously well documented. I just run, want to read this excerpt, and if you can uh, keep up with me on the slides, all right? Okay. So, because I want this, I want this to be, uh, you know, for you to really absorb this. So, okay. So this is what Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz writes: To say that the United States is a colonialist settler state is not to make an accusation, but rather to face historical reality, without which consideration not much in US history makes sense, unless indigenous peoples are erased. But indigenous nations through resistance have survived and bear witness to this history. In the era of worldwide decolonization in the second half of the 20th century, the former colonial powers and their intellectual apologists mounted a counterforce, often called neocolonialism, from which multiculturalism and postmodernism emerged. Although much revisionist US history reflects neocolonialist strategy and attempt to accommodate new realities in order to retain the dominance, neocolonialist methods signal victory for the colonized. Such approaches pry off a lid long kept tightly fastened. One result has been the presence of significant numbers of indigenous scholars in US universities who are changing the terms of analysis. The main challenge for scholars in revising US history in the context of colonialism is not lack of information, nor is it one of methodology. Certainly, difficulties with documentation are no more problematic than they are in any other area of research. Rather, the source of the problems has been the refusal or inability of U.S. historians to comprehend the nature of their own history, U.S. history. The fundamental problem is the absence of the colonial framework. Through economic penetration of indigenous societies, the European and Euro-American colonial powers created economic dependency and imbalance of trade, then incorporated the indigenous nations into spheres of influence and controlled them indirectly or as protectorates with indispensable use of Christian missionaries and alcohol. So let me take a moment here and ask, uh, what solutions can you imagine for the problems created by colonialism and or settler colonialism? Settler colonialism makes it impossible to leave because. So, since it's impossible to leave, what can be done? Self governance of the Aboriginal peoples. Self governance. Mm -hmm. ah. self okay. What, what does that look like for. for well, it's, um, there are certain uh, bands and tribes across Canada that have limited self governance in that a lot of the uh, local decisions are handled by the band or tribal leadership, which takes priority over the national law or boundaries. So for example, policing is often done by Aboriginal policemen or police uh, people. Um, and whatever is done in, at that level takes priority over the provincial and the federal Level. So it's their own laws for their own purposes within uh, a particular band of tribe. Thank you. Okay. Who is? Well, just one answer I'm seeing in what is being written here is is honesty. Part of the solution is 
just being honest about what is okay. and has been. Honesty. And maybe what will be, like if you make uh, certain policies about land and you don't. Doing it transparently? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Make sure you uphold those things. Okay. Uh, language has been a big battleground between the mainstream and Aboriginal societies in that Aboriginal societies tend to rely on the oral tradition and many lands were lost because they couldn't quote prove that these were their lands and so the, the white people came in and said look we have this contract this piece of paper that says it's, it's my land even though First Nations have been living on it for 20,000 years. So the struggle over language is a big one, too. Okay, language? You know, when you talk about colonialism, it, it isn't just about land. When you said language, it like, went on because, like, I've been involved with lots of indigenous people. Not only was their land taken, their spirituality was taken through the missionaries and the alcohol, and <coughs> their place in creation was knocked over, you might say, and replaced with something strange <laughs> to them yeah. and a new way of looking at the whole of their creation. As in, for example, they regard themselves not as keepers of the land or people above. They are part of the whole web of I'm sure everybody here knows uh, knows about that, but that was taken too. So, and what they're trying to get back today, or trying to relate to us, is they have a spirituality. They have this. We have ignored it and we've called it evil and savage and whatever, but it is real and is holy, and we should accept that and embrace it. Okay. Yeah, you know, you're reminding me, I, uh, uh, Saturday when I was here, I, I referred to the case where the United, where the Sioux people of the Dakotas sued the United States government and they won, uh, uh, asserting that the, the treaties had been broken and that they were entitled to the Black Hills. And uh, the government tried to settle by giving them $800 million. But they, did, they didn't want that. They say, you don't understand what we're missing here. Yeah, um, because land is just not a commodity, right. which we're talking about in colonialism. The colonial powers came thinking in resource. their life, it is a resource, it is land, it is money. Yeah. To them, it is life. And right? it's their heritage, it's their, it's their history. It's yes. their, it's gone. It's, it's, a, it's gone. It's a way of being, and so there. And so, what happened was, is that because they declined to accept that settlement, uh, it's it's actually accruing interest because it was provided, but they refused to accept it. It's also the land where one of our most famous monuments is um, um, Mount Rushmore, <laughs> and and so the government is not too inclined to say you can have this. Uh, because it is the ultimate expression of imperialism, you know? <laughs> it's our presidents on your land. Yeah. <laughs> the, government, the government originally tried to keep the white people out of there, but there were so many miners coming in looking for gold and so much pressure that they uh, basically co to them after time. But they did originally, I believe, try to uh, keep the white people out. Yeah. But it was a losing battle with so much pressure coming in. Yeah, this is uh, so so solution. I mean, you know, I'm asking for for solutions, but let me ask: Do you even think it's possible? Do you think that there are solutions for the fact that we have settler colonialism in the Americas, and then we have migration uh, from? colonized lands going into the imperial powers lands now and they're trying to solve it. it, it can it can it can we coexist? Can we let it happen? Absolutely. Martin mm -hmm. Luther King said either we will learn to live together as brothers or die together as fools. Mm -hmm. okay. We have to live together. 
Okay. I think I've heard this, and this isn't, this isn't a huge solution, and I'm not talking about govern, governing or anything like that, but just being able to listen and be able to share heritage and stories in an open way and to feel listened um, for the people who are cloning lives. Okay. I think we're letting the mainstream off the hook a little bit, too, because we're focusing on um, kind of what Aboriginal societies can do. But we have to look at what the mainstream societies can do as well. And I think a big part of that has to be um, finding a way to um, give up power or share power with the Aboriginal societies. Uh, and I think that's a deep seated fear that we have. Because uh, I've seen many maps of Canada, for example, and of all the land treaties were settled in Canada, there'd be nowhere for the white people to live, right? Because there are so many overlapping claims and so on across the country that I think white people would just say, I don't think we want to go down that road. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that takes a lot of moral courage and willpower, and I just don't see white societies having that capability. So, on the First Nation side, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of will. But on the white side, not so much. You know what I, I would like to do, but we didn't solve the, uh, the audio thing, did we? Uh, we were waiting no, until we, break time. I don't, Raymond's here. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, you know, I was going to do this on the other side of the break, but I think if we can show this now, we, we couldn't get audio. We're plugged in. And there, I have like a three or four minute video that kind of leads us a little bit farther here. Okay, so. Um, So I brought this one to give away. So what did you get? To like the school? To anybody? I feel like we should give it to the library. Give it to the library? Yeah. Is that best, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Second best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I actually brought this one to give away, but it's already Raymond's now, so. <laughs> it could just try doing the volume up on the on the computer. Yeah, I think it's because sometimes you can just hit the button. Just button. No, like. It's all the way. It's all the way. No, no, no. Oh, it's that way. Oh, 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 technology. Like this one. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's that one that's right there. I realize that I need to that now. Oh, to, to, okay. To so can you drag it all the way back? Uh, okay. This is Christina F uh, Cleveland, Professor Christina Cleveland, teaches uh, at Duke University. And she's a real friend of mine. She, when she did her doctorate, she was part of our congregation in Santa Barbara, at UC Santa Barbara. Um, yeah, she writes for Christianity Today now. out of it as you can. That's right. Win. Win. <laughs> Exploit as many people as you can. That's right. That's, that is sustainable. <laughs> vacation Bible school at a church in our community and my vacation Bible school teacher called me a nigger and I didn't know what that meant. At the time I just knew it was bad 
Um, I knew it was something that made me different. And so I went home and I talked to my mom about it and she was livid. She was like the perfect mother bear. And that's how I learned that there are places where I was welcome in the church. So then what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> and then I started writing my book. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I guess that's when I realized, you know, that the world wasn't really a safe place. Um, and it was interesting that I first learned that the world wasn't a safe place at church. So I think oftentimes people have those experiences outside the church. But I had a pretty nitty gritty faith just from the beginning because of that. How did that affect your faith journey? I realized that I needed God to help me get through the church, to, to, to be in church, too. The church wasn't necessarily a space where I found utopia. It was a space where I wrestled to find God in the midst of the challenges. So, I mean, on the one hand, it was helpful because I think I had some realizations about what faith is like as a child that most people have when they go through their, like, you know, 20s or 30s, um, when they're starting to realize, wait, the church isn't as amazing as I thought it was. Yeah, you know, most people go to, I mean, not most people, but a lot of people go to big enough churches where they don't have the, they don't really get to see a lot of the behind the scenes dysfunction. Um, but I was a pastor's kid in a small church plant, and then I also was interacting with churches as someone who was different a lot. And so church was just another place in the world. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a categorically great place, although I had some great moments at church, yeah. So this is especially significant for me because I'm, I'm old enough to be her father. Her parents are really dear friends of mine, and we still have similar experiences even though she's a generation younger than myself. And uh, Christina, before she went to Duke, uh, well, even if uh, she was, she taught somewhere in Minneapolis, but before that, she taught at a Christian college in Santa Barbara after she uh, finished her doctorate. And she, oh, let me tell you in her blog. In her blog, she she celebrates her her years in our in our diverse congregation as what helped her not let go of hope completely uh, when it came to to church. But then she writes in her blog later, the horrible experience she had in a predominantly white Christian community. And uh, anyway, uh, at the beginning of this year, in January of this year, about a week in to the year, uh, that particular college, uh, the, uh, I got an email inviting me, asking if I would be their speaker for their annual Martin Luther King Day uh, assembly. And I thought that was kind of odd because it was only a week ahead and they're, you know, they're, they don't do stuff that way. Okay, it was only a week ahead. So then I inquired and I found out that they had somebody who pulled out. But they needed an African American. And there aren't that many of us in Santa Barbara. <laughs> um, the person that they had was actually going to fly in from Chicago. So um, I agreed to do it. And then I got another email asking me for a transcript. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I didn't ask them to speak. They asked me to speak. And then they asked me to for a transcript. So I mulled that over for a bit, and then I thought, okay. I had just written another entry for Huffington Post, and you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I referenced that college in my blog, not by name, but I told, what I told was the story of how slow American uh, religious schools, Christian schools, were to embrace the Martin Luther King holiday. And when my daughter was in, uh, I guess, maybe third, fourth grade, she was going to a Christian school. And all of her friends were free on that coming Monday. But she in the Christian school was scheduled to go to school. And I remember the, uh, the principal 
and I had a conversation. He says, you know, because like she's the only black kid in the school, and I'm the, by, at that point in my life I was bivocational, and I was actually teaching at the school. And he says, I understand if you and Charity want to take the day off Monday. And in my mind, I was thinking, why isn't everybody taking the day off Monday? Um, but I also referenced in that article that I wrote, I said, seems like the only places that didn't close for the Martin Luther King holiday were that school and the Christian college uh, right outside of town. So that's what I wrote about. And I got, got you know, so anyway, what, when he asked for a transcript, I thought, you know what, I don't have the creative energy. I got like six days to come up with something suitable um, that I didn't expect to do. So I said, I will come on condition that you let me share my blog. So I sent him the link. He read it. He said, uh, well, it certainly fits the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, then I got another email a day later. So it's like Wednesday. And he said, can we talk first? And, um, and I said, okay, there was this, we were going to be in the same area at some time, so we sat down together. And when we sat down, uh, the first thing I said was, okay, you invited me, but what I need to know is why you haven't invited the African Americans who have a connection with your school, like Christina Cleveland, who has taught there, and alumni that I'm still in conversation with. And, um, and he said, well, who else do you have in mind? And I said, Reggie Williams. At that time, he was teaching at Baylor. And uh, he says, well, you know, I thought about Reggie, but he seems a little bit too angry. And um, I, you know, I didn't have a rejoinder for that, but I just thought, wow, who's not angry? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I went ahead and I spoke that Friday for their assembly in this huge gymnasium with all of these students and the faculty and all these people. And um, I, I read word for word what I had written. And, uh, and then I added some more things at the end uh, to try to inspire them to, you know, the student body. And when it was over, I was surrounded with students. I don't think the faculty was that excited about what happened that day, but the students felt like they were finally affirmed. All right, so anyway, I go home and I, I message Reggie. I said, well, you know, I talked to, I won't say his name, he's got you, so. Um, I said, I talked to him and, uh, and, I, and I asked why he didn't uh, have, he'd ever had alumni uh, who are African American come on days like this. And uh, he said, you know, you were a little too angry. And Reggie says, he says, oh wow, I haven't even seen him. I had contact in 10 years. And that was, we were at a wedding together and we were both part of the wedding party, but you know, I don't even know what he's talking about. And then Reggie was angry. <laughs> <laughs> So Reggie, Reggie wrote him, and so, you know, we're, we're all being copied in this stream of messages, right? So Reggie writes him, and Reggie says, uh, listen, you know, your, your institution is on the flyleaf of my books, and uh, it's, you know, it's part of my CV, my resumes, and things like that. If I'm not going to be represented in a positive way, I would rather not be represented at all. Well, this person wrote back, and he said, well, I was having a personal conversation with David, and I didn't know. And, 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 and so I wrote Reggie back, and I said, personal but not private, because if it was private, he would have told you that he thought you were too angry and not me. So, you know, this thing is going on. And, uh, finally, this other person writes back, and he apologizes. And he says, do you know what? I know things are really volatile in this post-Ferguson era. So we just need to uh, have a meeting of the minds. Reggie said, I'm not looking for a place to speak. I have young children. I'm, I'm going to be in California next week. I'm speaking at Azusa Pacific and some other school he mentioned. 
Uh, and he said, because I'm doing a book signing, and I'm not really desperate to come places and speak, but I just want us to make sure that we're clear on everything. Um, I bring this up because it's not just Christina, it's not just Reggie, but I frequently have had encounters and friendships with people of color. I have one friend who was denied tenure because she was told that they questioned her Christian, the authenticity of her Christian faith. She is Indian American and she grew up in India. And she said, if I can be in a Hindu country and my family can be Christian, I bet my Christianity is about as authentic as anybody's here. <laughs> Um, but she was denied tenure, eminently qualified because she is now uh, head of global studies at California State University, Monterey. And then, like I mentioned, Christina Zetu. Reggie teaches at McCormick Seminary now. And then I have another friend. She's Chinese American. And she blogs about the school all the time. <laughs> My. <laughs> She, she's at a school on the East Coast, but I haven't talked to her lately, so I'm not going to mention her. Um, the, uh, the point that I'm making is that I, our culture, our Christian culture, doesn't understand the machinations that we as Christians of color get put through just to survive, just to exist in their unconscious world. So. Um, let me ask this. Do you see a solution for that kind of thing? I think education has to play a big role. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we have to understand. Um, we have to understand the history as you're pointing out here tonight. But um, that's all good. We need to know that. But we also have to learn to move forward and bridge your differences, embrace other cultures. How do we do that? I don't know, but I see things on Facebook that's really <laughs> <laughs> And it's not, you know, it's happening here. It's just another word now. What, what I hear you saying is, well, let me try and put it in my words, is that the culture is not friendly to minorities at all, and well, I wouldn't say at all. Well, I mean, in, in many ways, it's it's unfriendly and sometimes hostile. And the way I see it is, the religion you you can hardly separate culture and religion. The religion is part of that. So the religion reflects what the culture already believes, whether that's Christianity in the West or whether that's Hinduism, because they have racist, you know, yeah. racist problems in India where you know certain groups are no good. So what what you're actually saying, at least what I'm maybe I'm interpreting what you're yeah. saying, is that the culture is unfriendly and sometimes hostile. And the religion is simply a part of that culture, so it reflects what that culture already. Yeah, already I think has. yeah, I think that the religion does help to feed it. Um, at the same time, I hasten to add that some of my greatest allies.